Hi guys, Grand J here and welcome to our Opus 4 set review. In today's video, we'll be talking about the fire cards. So, let's get started. First card on the list is Hoyin. I believe it's called Hoyin. Don't know. Uh, this card is a little bit hard to pronounce. So, it's a 2 cost forward, 5,000 power. So, it's a little bit below the curve, but it has a special ability of if you control 3 or more category WAF characters, uh, Hoyin gets plus 4,000 power, and if you have 5 or more, um, gets plus 1,000 power and brave. So, this is actually a really cool forward. Um, it really sort of builds into the whole WAF, yeah, the WAF strategy, uh, the WAF deck. Um, so yeah, so when you have three or more category uh, characters, sorry, characters, um, yeah, she becomes a 9,000 power for, for two. So this is actually pretty easy to achieve. All you have to do is just gotta get free WAF back, uh, backups down and backups are generally pretty difficult to interact with in this game. So uh, most of the time your opponent won't really be able to interact with them. And as soon as you have free down, she'll be coming in at 9,000 for two, which is extremely above the curve. Typically you're expecting your two costs to be at around the 6,000 power. If they've got some sort of conditional trigger, they usually bump up to seven or at most eight. But this like coming in at nine is really, really strong. And if you are able to get down the full five uh, ca uh, WAF category characters, then she gets plus 1,000 power extra and brave on top. So that becomes a 9,000 power forward and brave at two costs. So this is extremely good. Um, this card is unbelievably powerful. So basically, I definitely foresee people going to be experimenting with this card. Definitely try to be building up to the, the five the five WAF, uh, five WAF backup deck. Um, I'm looking like, it's looking like the, this card is going to be sitting in fire slash earth because that's where most of the wolf backups are, but there are some other exceptions. Um, so ice does have a uh, mecha chocobo and it also has Sid, uh, the Sid robot backup. So there are some other ways that this card can reach five, uh, wolf char characters, um, outside of fire and earth. But I believe that that's the deck that she'll be seeing most play in. And I'm really excited to be using her. Um, plenty of cards will also synergize with cards that are two costs or less. So. Um, you can definitely, I definitely foresee her being played with Phoenix, being able to cost, uh, cost four, cost, uh, deal 2000 damage to all your opponents forwards, and then being able to get this 9000 power, uh, brave character is extremely, extremely strong. So I definitely foresee her seeing a lot of play for this reason. Next card is Red Mage. It is a two cost fire backup and it has fire, dull, choose one forward. During this turn, the damage dealt to it is increased by 1000. So, this is a backup that does not consume itself, so it's a renewable backup, so that's pretty cool. And it basically allows you to amplify damage to a certain forward. Most of the time, I definitely foresee this uh, being used as a, like, uh, just a one cost additional pump onto, like, damage or into, uh, nuke spells. So this is already pretty handy in regards to that. Definitely, it helps you get over stuff like Minwoo. So if you're just one short, being able to put yourself one, uh, one up allows you to get over Minwoo and allow you to actually deal damage. So this is actually, um, comparable to the two cost backup, uh, from, uh, uh from Opus 2 called Summoner where you could break it to amplify all damage by a thousand for the turn. However, this card only uh, amplifies damage to one particular forward, so it's actually a lot safer. So you're not uh, going to be in a situation where you're going to receive additional damage back to your forwards. Um, and this uh, this has been an issue with fire in the past where they had to use summoner, where they had to use four cost palum, 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 palum or porum, porum. I forget the, the, the fire one. Um, and they increase 1000 damage. And that means a lot of your opponent's nukes were also big enough to like, deal with your guys. So this is a great handy way to get your guys to do a little bit extra damage and to have no like sort of back um, backlash from that ability. Um, Fire's already got a lot of really good two cost backups and I think it's gonna be really difficult for this card to really contest all those spots. So it's already got Selfie, it's already got Red Mage. Um, this, uh, this card I definitely think can find a slot. Definitely I feel that this is a little bit better than Summoner if you aren't um, short on the backup spots. Um, but yeah, it's really difficult to place where it's going to be. This card is viable to see play, but whether it's good enough to sort of fit into um, the current fire decks is a, a little bit difficult to say at this stage. Next card is Ifrit. It is a two cost summon. It's an EX burst. Choose one forward, deal it 4,000 damage. If you control five or more fire characters, deal it 7,000 damage instead. This card I think is a little bit too conditional and it, the payoff isn't good enough for its, a, for its ability. So at... At two costs, dealing 4,000 damage is very, a very minimal amount. 4,000 damage is a very, very small amount. And it's something where if you want to play a summon and you only get a certain amount of summon slots in your deck, so you generally only be playing from eight to at most, say, 11, uh, 11 summons, you really want the summons in your deck to actually be able to do something impactful on their own to at least being able to take out a sort of mid-range forward. This card by itself doesn't really do that. 4,000 damage is very minimal. And if you hit one of these as an EX burst early on in the game, I don't foresee this doing very, uh, doing very much by itself. 
if you do get to a point where you do have five fire characters, dealing 7,000 damage isn't enough, of a pay, isn't enough of a payoff. And a lot of times, most decks would rather have the the consistency and the reliability of having a free cost sprint Hilda to always deal 7,000 damage. 7,000 is a pretty good a pretty good sort of threshold to be at where you're killing anything that's really like free cost and below, whereas here you're not really killing anything at all. And so I, I don't think the payoff is good enough for this card. Potentially, if this dealt 8,000 damage for two, then it sort of would make the payoff uh, relevant enough because 8,000 is a very, very good number to be hitting. 7,000 is a little bit less and the payoff for having five fire characters, even though it's not too difficult in a mono fire deck, I don't think the payoff is good enough for a card like this. So I don't think it's gonna really see any play. Next, we have Edgar. Edgar is a five cost, 7,000 power forward. It's got EX burst. When Edgar enters the field, you may search your deck for a card named Seven and Ed add it to your hand. It's also got ability dull, choose one forward, deal it 2,000 damage. And it's got an uh, S ability of uh, two fires, one dull, choose one forward, break it. So this card has a lot of abilities. Every time I say a card has three different abilities on it and is on curve, then it is going to be OP. However, this card, I think it's it's kind of missing a little bit there. So um, yes, it does have an EX burst. So EX burst, search your deck for seven. Unfortunately, at this stage, there's only one seven. So there's very limited targets for the, the, the cards that this can search for. So unlike Steiner, it doesn't have a whole range of options. You can only search for one card in your deck. And so you really have to be relying on seeing these EX bursts early before you run out of sevens. Um, next, it's dull ability isn't particularly too um, isn't particularly too amazing. Just dealing 2,000 damage for a fire card isn't isn't particularly amazing. And it's a very small and minimal amount. And finally, it's S ability is kind of held back by the fact that there's only three Edgars in the game right now. Like, so this one Edgar, which means you're gonna have maximum free copies, which means you're gonna not get this S ability as, mo as often as you would like. Even though straight up it's it's just like a choose a do break it that's a that's pretty good ability. Um, I think that this card is a little bit too situational at the moment. If there were more Sabins or more Edgars, um, then definitely I, I would think this card becomes very very playable. But right now, due to the limited number of Sabins and Edgars, this card's going to be a little bit uh, a little bit inconsistent. I'm not saying it's a bad card. Definitely the fact that it's got older like it ticks older boxes um, is is very good. But I think that. Yeah, there's going to be things holding it back, and that's simply the the, the low number of targets and um, low number of resources that you can use to trigger off this card's abilities. Next one, we have Garland. It's a six cost, nine thousand power forward. So it's a, it's about on curve. It's where you expect when Garland enters the field, you may play one fire backup of cost three or less from your hand onto the field. Dull. Unfortunately, I don't think that this card is sort of like good enough. Um, we've had plenty of cards in the in the past where they've cost around the six cost mark and they come in and they play a four cost or something uh, something of that nature. So you have Earth, uh, in Earth you had Vanille, which is a six cost forward at 8,000 that put in a four cost uh, four, four cost Earth forward. This card, six, for nine, uh, six cost for 9,000, it is a little bit stronger, but being limited to play only a fire backup of cost three or less is really limiting. Um, if this card said like play a fire character of three or less, then that de definitely opens up a lot more options for, for this card. But at this stage, it doesn't seem like you can sort of, re uh, you're not really getting enough value for this card and inherently it doesn't have enough value by itself. So it's not even like Geese, where Geese was like a five for 8,000 and could get a free and you get to draw two, discard two. This is just six or 9,000 you get a fire backup. So um, this card's limited in its uses and the payoff for triggering it is not very good. Um, definitely there are uh, there are quite a few free uh, free, uh, free cost fire, uh, fire backups that are pretty good. So you do have uh, stuff like Blackwall, you do have um, Labrow. Um, yeah, so you have the, all, the, all these sort of cards, but the sort of payoff is kind of like too narrow. So I think that's going to be what's limit this uh, limit this card's playability and constructed. Next, we have the first legendary of the set, Caius. So when Caius, oh, sorry, I suppose Caius is a six cost 9,000 power forward. And when Caius enters the field, you may search your deck for one card named Bahamut, add it to your hand. When Caius attacks, choose one forward. You may discard one card named Bahamut from your hand. If you do so, deal at 7,000. So Caius is kind of like uh, lightning from Opus 1 in that he's a six cost 9,000 power forward. When he comes into play, you get to search for a specific summon. So in this case, you get to search Bahamut. And yeah, and Kais has an additional ability of whenever he attacks, you can choose to discard a Bahamut from your hand to deal 7,000 damage to a guy, which is like effectively a free, like free, seven, uh, free, free zero CP cost 7,000 damage, even though you're discarding a card. Um, so in that, in that regard, this card is pretty strong on two fronts. So one, it does give you like a, a higher, a higher power forward that can play on, on, on efficiency. So it effectively becomes a four, uh, four CP 9,000 power forward, which is pretty good. Um, 
Fire does have a couple of like forwards of that similar sort of value at the moment. It's already got Rubicante, which is a five, um, 4,000, uh, 4,000, 9,000, uh, four costs, 9,000 power forward. And the other one can effectively also become a four CP, 9,000 power forward as well. Um, but they do kind of have their own limitations and drawbacks, whereas Caius is all value. Um, so in this, in this regard, this card also sees, uh, uh, also brings, uh, this set also brings forward another Bahamut. So now you have two Bahamuts. So this Bahamut and the previous Opus 1 Bahamut. So you have two different copies of Bahamuts you can deal with. You can use Kaius to search for the relevant Bahamut when you need to. So that's pretty handy as well. And yeah, it means that if you do have those extra copies of those nine cost Bahamuts and you can't really play them because nine cost Bahamut is quite a card and like sort of mana investment, that means you're able at, at least towards the mid game, just like pitch them to deal 7,000 damage, which is a very respectable amount of damage. This combined with say like Summoner or the Red Mage that we were talking about earlier on before, can get up to 8,000 damage and that's a pretty respectable amount of damage by itself. So this card is pretty good. It's definitely like not, I don't think that this card is a overpowered card, but I think it's a very, uh, I definitely think it's um, above average, but I don't think it's great yet. I think it's pretty good, but I don't think it's sort of great. So this card will be definitely will definitely see play in fire decks, but um, how core it is to the like to the fire deck is yet to be seen. Next we have Cyan. So Cyan is a free cost seven thousand power forward. Something to note is that Cyan is a category six forward. So there are, um, this set has a lot of support for category six. So that's something to note. So Cyan has Brave and it gives all your other uh, gives you all your other category six forwards. Um, Brave as well. Category six forwards other than Cyan, you control game Brave. It's kind of weird. Okay, so specifically he has Brave, but he doesn't give himself Brave, which is kind of weird. Um, but yeah, so yeah, so he's basically a seven thousand, uh, seven thousand, three for seven thousand Brave, and it gives all your other uh, FF six cards Brave. Also has a interesting ability. Um, so just so S and Dull, choose one forward at the beginning of your next main phase. One if Cyan is on your field, break it. So that's that's kind of cool. It's it's another one of those sort of. Uh, if this card survives until your next turn type effects, then do do something so it forces your opponent to like deal with it. So that's that's pretty cool. Um, this card by itself is not particularly like particularly amazing. Um, just being a free a brave free seven k is like inherently by itself not super amazing. Giving all your other guys brave is kind of cool, but like it's it's kind of really difficult to sort of see the value of it yet. Um, its value really sort of comes from like its sort of its s ability, which means that your opponent is forced to deal with it. Um, so it's it's really difficult to sort of like predict how good this card is going to be. If your opponent doesn't like if your opponent doesn't prioritize it, then there is a chance that like Bushido Fang will like wreck one of your guys. So potentially your your like you, you play a sign on your turn and then like let's say if your opponent doesn't deal with it, all of a sudden you always have to your opponent has to be afraid of you just using Bushido Fang to kill one of their guys if they're not prioritizing not prioritize removing it. So it's a card that's sort of like pseudo lightning rods uh, effects to, towards himself and it's just like not a terrible forward by itself so it's it's a decent card but i don't like again i don't know if it's good enough to really sort of push the push the archetype forward next we have scholar so scholar is a yet yet another two cost fire cp backup it's fire dull puts scholar into a break zone choose up to two forwards and point controls deal them three thousand damage so a good card to compare this to is Opus One Magus, which uh, when it enters place, deal free, deal three thousand damage to all your opponent's forwards. So effectively, this is kind of like a sort of pseudo AOE card in which it deals three K to two guys. Generally, that's not going to be enough to kill most guys unless you're playing, your opponent's playing those like one cost, two cost, three thousand power forwards. So in general, this isn't going to be killing any guys. But generally, this is what this card's effect is going to be: is to set up um, other AOE abilities that are also around the three, uh, three, four, five K range where you can like take two dudes out at the same time. So. Um, the, the big sort of thing that sort of limits this card compared to say Magus is that um, Magus doesn't target. So if your opponent has like say Zidane or has like Snow, um, Magus could wipe them out because you it's an AOE ability and you couldn't choose those forwards. Whereas Scholar here has that limitation. But Scholar does have the benefit in that it allows your, um, it allows you to sort of, um, uh, it allows you to block in combat, um, chump block in combat and then allows you to finish off guys so let's say if your opponent has like say two 10ks or two 9ks and your opponent attacks you can chump block with your six and you bl chump block with your seven you lose two guys but then you can use scholar to finish off your opponent your your two of your opponent's big forwards as well so that's kind of like a um the the benefit of using scholar that being said though fire isn't too bad at fighting fighter has plenty of guys that are around the eight like seven eight nine mark and they're all very good at fighting they have a lot of guys that are able to boost their power so in general you're not going to be using scholar all that much to let your small guys trade into bigger guys 
Um, it's just going to be adding additional damage for your ping effects. And I think 3000 damage is kind of like not good enough by itself. So I think Scholar is not going to be good enough to sort of, to sort of see you play in a fire deck. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Next we have Ranger. So Ranger is a free cost uh, standard unit forward at 4,000 power, so it's pretty below the curve. It's got haste, and when Ranger attacks, it deals 2,000 damage to all forwards and opponent controls. So um, there's a couple of, uh, couple of bits and pieces to break down here. So it is pretty below the curve. So typically when you're looking at free CP forwards, you're looking at 7,000 being the benchmark. It does have haste though, so it does kind of like lose a little bit of like power in regards to that. Um, but it does gain the ability to deal 2,000 damage to all your opponents forward. So if your opponent doesn't have any sort of like Minwu type abilities, then this card is effectively hasting for like 6,000 damage. Um, so like if your opponent your opponent can't really block with like a 6,000 power forward to sort of um, and not to lose their guy when dealing with Ranger. Um, obviously there are benefits if you have any sort of damage amplification effects. It means you can bump it up to like a 3k board wipe. So I think that this card is going to be um, it's going to have niche uses. Um, especially combined with the like damage amplification effects that fire has. Um, this card is kind of a cheesy card. So if anything, it will see cheesy play. Um, but I don't think that this card is a particularly good card. And at the highest level of competition or at like the like upper end of, of competition, you want all your cards to be standalone good and then together much better. And this card is standalone, not particularly good, but together pretty okay. So in that regard, this card will see fun niche play for sure. And there will be comments that you can play with this card, but by itself is not good enough to really see sort of top level competitive play. Next we have Black Mage. It's a four CP backup. When it enters the play, choose up to two forwards, deal them 5,000 damage. Recently, in, <laughs> like in, because I played a lot of pre-releases um, in the last four or five days, this card has been a standout winner for me. Um, dealing 5,000 damage to two, uh, to two forwards is actually pretty good for four CP. Um, but talking about constructed play, it's actually not bad. It's uh, not bad as well. So it actually sets up a lot of situations where sort of like small to medium AOE abilities can like uh, kill guys. So if you play this and then you play, say, Scholar, you can wipe out two AKs, which is pretty good. You play this and you play a bomb, you can wipe out two 9Ks. So like f dealing 5,000 damage to two guys is actually a very good like place to be at. Um, this card, like depending on um on like backup costs and all that sort of stuff this card could actually see more like more play in sort of more ping orientated fire deck especially because like a fire has a lot of uh, cards that can just very cheaply and very easily do like anywhere between say three to six thousand damage but that's usually not uh, not enough to kill a guy so if you can play a couple of guys that have these sort of effects do some ping damage black mage can finish off and do take out two guys at the same time and it is a backup as well so this card uh has potential I think in those specific sort of decks, it might see two cards. Um, and also, it, something just random to note, it is a Black Mage. So if people are looking to build that uh, Opus 3 5 Black Mage deck, then this is another Black Mage to add into it. And this card is actually not a bad Black Mage for that. So yet another gimmick strategy to play into, but this card is like semi-competitive viable. Next, we have Sage. So Sage, yeah, yet another two cost, C, uh, another two CP backup. There's so many two CP backups in this set. Um, it's it's actually like really weird because it's like it doesn't seem like there's a lot of free CP backups in this set. But Sage is dull. Put Sage into break zone. Choose one forward you control. If it deals damage to your forward this turn, the damage increases by two thousand instead. So this is kind of like the inverse of Red Mage. So Red Mage. Um, earlier on, we were talking about you choose a guy, it takes um, 1,000 damage more every time it receives damage. This time is the opposite. You choose one of your guys and it amplifies all the damage it deals by 1,000 for the rest of the turn. Um, the downside is that it does break Sage. So, um, yeah, you do lose your backup. Um, and, uh, yeah, you do lose your backup. But the amplification is, is uh, greater. So it amplifies by 2,000 damage. So um, if, if your guy is a first striker, this is good with it. If your guy is going to be doing AoE damage, this is potentially quite good as well. So yeah, bumping up by 2,000 damage is quite a lot. And um, something that decks kind of need is they want their two comps backups to come in and they want to have a very cheap, efficient way of breaking them so they can clear up spots for some of their bigger backups towards later in the game. And Sage kind of fulfills that pretty well. So it definitely will see play in any sort of deck that can sort of like really make use of its like damage, damage amplification power. And I, as I was saying earlier with Ranger being um, a, free, uh, a free cost free cost haste guy that deals 2,000 damage or, uh, whenever it attacks, Amplifying its damage with Sage is actually pretty good. AoEs for four or four K damage, you know, and then potentially you can then combo it with a Black Mage to like finish guys off. So in that regard, this uh, this card um, probably, I think, in my opinion, will replace Summoner in the in regards to yeah, it's just 
um, in forward to forward or character character or like sort of forward to forward combat or forward to forward abilities that this card is going to be stronger than summoner and it doesn't give it doesn't have the drawback of amplifying damage dealt to your own guys as well so um, this card is pretty good I think it's going to like pseudo replace summoner in most of fire decks if fire does have the space and does want a similar type ability moving forward next we have goblin so one of the monsters from this set so um, goblins are pretty straightforward monster Put, uh, it's a one cost monster, put Goblin into Break Zone, choose one forward you control, it gains haste until the end of the turn, draw one card. So, the best card to sort of compare this to in fire is Belias the Gigas, which is a very, very good fire summon. So, what do we get in comparison? So, we're paying one less compared to Belias the Gigas, and we're not getting a plus 1000 pump, we're not getting first strike. So, we're just getting the haste and the draw card effect from this. The upside to this is that we are able to bank goblin. So in that regards, you can put a goblin down on a turn where you just have an extra five CP spare, put that down, and then you can sort of just hold on to it, you know? Um, and then whenever you need to, you can always just use it to give you guys haste. If you um, And if your opponent does try to break your goblin in response to, um, in res yeah, your, if your opponent does try to break your goblin using like a de destruction ability, in response, you can always just break your goblin to give like one of your random guys haste, even though it doesn't do anything, to draw yourself a card. So your opponent is generally going to be, um, disincentivized to try to destroy it while you've got any forwards on the field at all. So this card is going to be, uh, this card takes away the combat benefits of Belasta Gigas, but it does allow you to sort of like save up for combos. So definitely I could see, foresee this card seeing play in any deck that ran like, like say for example, Legendary Tetis, where you want to just have this guy available and just be able, be able to play the Legendary Tetis, give him haste and go in. Whereas having Belasta Gigas means you have to hold an extra card in hand um, and you have to hold the extra CP available on the on those big swing turns. But Goblin, you can just kind of bank it. Worst case scenario, you can always just like claim it back, um, uh, claim it back to cycle through one card. So um, in in that in that regard, it's actually not a, not a bad card at all. It doesn't do much. It basically is a cycle and just gives a guy haste. Um, and Fire doesn't have any sort of really renewable ways to give haste. They do have two cost Sage from an earlier set as a backup. But in general, you kind of want to get your backups in first, then your forwards. And this card is something that after you get your backups in, you can just spend an extra bit of CP, get, uh, get, put Goblin in, and then Goblin's always there, ready to give your guys that threat of hasting in. Um, so yeah, this card's, this card's pretty good. Um, I'm still not sort of convinced how, whether all decks are going to be playing monsters and that sort of thing yet, but I think if Fire is playing monsters, this is probably going to be one of them. Next card we have is Zack. So Zack is a free cost backup. It's EX Burst. When Zack enters the field, choose one card named Cloud, or drop soldier in your break zone and add it to your hand. So obviously everyone's immediate thought is, yep, uh, Zach can help you get cloud. So obviously you got the the legendary, uh, so you got the, the legendary light cloud, you got the new light cloud from the set, you've got all the like fire clouds and like, yeah, so that's like five clouds available to you. But not only that, but Zach also allows you to return soldiers from your break zone to your hand. And there are actually quite a few interesting soldiers. So um, a, lot of, um, a lot of the FF7, I don't know what archetype they are, but quite a few FS7 characters are, are soldiers as well. So Genesis is a soldier, Angel is a soldier, and Ice Sephiroth, like five cost Ice Sephiroth is also a soldier. So um, yeah, I'm not sure. Like the, it's like the Red Wing, Black Wing, and Blue Wing or something. Those guys, they're all soldiers. Um, and yeah, a couple of the clouds are soldiers as well. So um, this card doesn't necessarily have to see play in like strictly a cloud deck. Potentially you could be using it to, to pull back Sephiroth or pull back Genesis. And Genesis is a fantastic card. So using that Zack in a Fire Ice aggressive deck to pull back Genesis actually doesn't sound too bad as well. Oh, that, yeah, doesn't sound too bad as well. And like Zack is not one of those cards where currently he's being fought like he's being used in his other slot so you're not using legendary zack so much and you're not using that opus one zack all that much so this card is a card that's able to use this version and without limiting you from using the other zacks too much so next card is samurai it is a four cp standard unit at eight thousand power so that's pretty standard four for eight thousand if you have received five uh, five points of damage or more samurai gates plus one thousand and brave so there's not much, not much really to add. It's a, it's a standard unit. Um, yeah, it gets some extra bonuses when you're sort of behind. Like it's pretty behind though. When you're at five points of damage, that's like kind of you have to be really quite careful, and it does sort of like help you in that it gives it brave. And so yeah, so that's not bad. Um, thing is, is that, uh, thing is, is that standard unit decks are, have always been the sort of like tier two, tier one point five sort of fun deck. Um, so yeah, definitely this card. Um, definitely this card can see play if you want to play standard units. It's not bad for that. Fire has plenty of good standard units. It's also got, uh, what's the fire guy? Fire standard unit guy? 
Lunaf, I think, um, which gives them all haste as well, so that's pretty good. Um, but yeah, like I don't really think that this card will see too much play in standard units because in standard units right now, you're mainly looking at water or mainly looking at ice, potentially looking at wind as well. Fire doesn't really sort of uh, give you enough, incent uh, it doesn't incentivize you enough to run like fire standard units. But you know, this card's not terrible as fire standard units go. Next, we have one of the like uh, one of the most interesting and sort of meta shifting fire cards of this set, I reckon, and it is Shadow. So Shadow is a, a four CP seven thousand power forward, so it's a little bit below the curve, but it does have first strike, so um, it does sort of even itself out at its ability. And here's when things get interesting: for two fire, remove one card from your uh, remove one card from your hand from the game, choose one forward, deal it one thousand damage for each CP required to play the remove card. So what that means is you pay two fire and you remove a card from your hand if it's a four CP card. Um, this effect deals four uh, four thousand damage to a um, to a forward, um, and yeah, like if it if it's a seven CP card, deals seven thousand um, damage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Something to note, though, um, we believe that we're pretty confident is that this deals one packet for however much damage it is. So it deals one packet of seven K if it's a seven CP uh, seven CP card, um, and so on. It doesn't deal seven packets of one thousand. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty sure it's one packet of damage, so no summoner shenanigans where you're like doubling up all those 1,000 packets. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty confident about that. So the reason why this is uh, pretty interesting is because um, with um, uh, yeah with Bahamut being much more playable now um, with Caius, um, it means that yeah you're gonna have you're going to be in situations where you're more likely to have Bahamuts in hand, and you know what? Even if you don't intend to cast Bahamut, using Shadow to use two CP and discard Bahamut for 9k damage is pretty good still. Um, so yeah, so it means that Kaius can give you Bahamut's if Kaius doesn't get to attack to deal his 7k um, or 7k is not enough You can always use shadow to like throw a Bahamut at a guy and deal it like 9k and that's very good 2 CP 9k is Fantastic um, in addition to this it's got first strike as well. So if you if you're playing any sort of like mono fire deck um, he, He's just a very difficult forward to attack and block uh, block against um, simply because yeah, it's very, very easy for him to just pay two CP and just chuck like a three or four K um, damage at a, at a forward and then first strike over them. Um, that it's really, really strong ability. It does burn through a lot of cards, but it makes Shadow a, um, a forward that's really difficult to deal with. And for one additional thing that I think is really going to make, sh and the, the reason why I think Shadow really sort of makes the fire archetype way more interesting to um, play now is because now fire can actually run Eight, like three copies of legendary Sephiroth, and now so one of Fire's main weaknesses is um, is Minwoo because it has so many uh, ways to ping. But Minwoo is just such a uh, such a difficult card for Fire to deal with because it doesn't inherently have ways to de uh, deal with backups. And so like some Fire decks would run legendary uh, would run legendary Sephiroth as an a cost way to deal with those Minwoos. Um, but yeah, but oftentimes if you do find yourself with like one or two of them in hand and you can't play them, they become dead cards. Now with Shadow, it means that you can run three legendary Sephiroth, like maybe not even three, maybe two, but in the situations where they are clumped in your hand, you can always have a secondary use of them. You can always pitch them for Shadow to do AK for two CP and that's a very good strong effect by itself. And yeah, like obviously like AK is like pretty decent number. So generally, even if your opponent does have Moon Moon, maybe you can just throw it and like deal AK and just finish a guy off. Um, without being forced to use them. So Shadow opens up a lot of fantastic uh, deck construction choices. It actually makes Fire a lot more able to run multiple lights and multiple darks simply because it can always chuck them as yeah, just as secondary uses as well. Um, so yeah, this is a this is a great, fantastic card. Um, I really look forward to sort of like breaking out more uh, more into the Fire archetype with this deck, uh, with this card. And also something to note, it is a Final Fantasy VI character as well. So um, it just gets uh, that bonus from all the other Final Fantasy VI characters and their synergies. Next card is Bahamut. Bahamut is a 4 CP summon. Choose a forward, deal at 8,000 damage. If it put from the field into breaks on this turn, remove from the game instead. So um not much to really say about this this is a perfect like a perfect nuke for fire so 4 cp 8000 damage that's great that's exactly where you want to be it pretty much deals with like pretty much any sort of four like 4 cp forward and as a little bonus on the side if it breaks it, it removes from the game which means that if there are enter breaks on abilities this card deals with them as well 4 cp is a pretty manageable number so this is a great fantastic card to be putting into fire decks only downside is it isn't ex burst if it was ex burst it'd probably be too strong but if you want good, um, if you want good reliable removal, Bahamut's a way to go. 
Um, it's great. Also, it had synergy with Opus One Fang. So now that we have two Bahamuts um, and we have a way to search for Bahamuts with Caius, then Fang is now going to be more relevant, more quote unquote relevant. Um, so yeah, potentially casting Bahamut for 2 CP, 8k damage, remove dude from field, while I have Fang on the field, is actually very, very strong. And I'm really interested to sort of see how the, like, the 6 Bahamut deck goes. Um, yeah, so in, in, in regards to just regular fire decks, I could, I could see them running 2 of these pre pretty much. And in the like, Bahamut deck, definitely free off. This is a fantastic card, you'll be seeing a lot of this if you're playing against fire decks for sure. Next we have Marauder. Marauder is a 2 CP forward at 1000 power, so significantly below the curve, um, but it does get the benefit of when Marauder attacks, Marauder gains plus 8000 power until the end of the turn. So it becomes effectively a 9000 uh, 9, power forward for 2 CP whenever it attacks. So it's very difficult to block, but most of the time it's going to die pretty instantly, and I think that that's the main problem with this card, is that unless you've got like some way to like... Basically, unless you've got the fire standard unit support, Lunaf, to make him haste, this guy is bad because 1,000, 1 CP forwards are going to die to anything. Pretty much every color has a way to just go random 1k CP for zero cost, okay? And this guy is going to die to him every time. It's going, it's like against I, against wind, it instant dies. Against fire, it's instantly dead. Against like water, you can just like use anything to sort of like debuff it to zero. Um, against most things, I think ice and earth are the only thing that doesn't have like super easy way to just deal 1k, um, to guys. Um, but then again, like Earth has some like some like AOE type damage as well. So this card is pretty bad. Um, unless you're playing Lunaf and you're trying to cheese them out with like two or three Marauders or something. Um, which then again, it's sweet. You get free like free damage, and then all of a sudden your opponent uses one AOB, AOE ability and kills all of them. Um, this card is not particularly good. Uh, potentially you might see some sort of cheese play of like you attack with this guy, it goes with 9,000 power, and then you use something like Raoban to then like shoot that 9,000 damage, or you use like Amaran to shoot that 9,000 damage at something. But that's pretty cheesy. Um, but yeah, so like this will, <laughs> this card's power is strong, but it's not consistent. It therefore will see play in some sort of tier 2.5 cheese deck where someone's going to play this, attack with it, then Amaranth's going to fire it off for 9k, or Marsh is going to dull it for 9k, or do some sort of crazy crap like that. Um, so yeah, so this will be fun in that regard, but otherwise, um, generally don't play it unless you're just trying to play a fun deck, and there's nothing wrong with that. Next, we have Bomb. So it's the next monster we'll be talking about. It's a 2 CP monster for fire. Until, uh, so you pay 1 fire to make it a forward. So um, until the end of turn, Bomb becomes a forward 5,000 power um, and also has the ability of put Bomb into the break zone, deal 4,000 damage to all forwards. Um, you can only use this ability once per turn. So using this ability once per turn is the turn them into a forward power, not the Bomb power. Um, so in that regard, um, this card is kind of weird. So to 2 CP and for fire to create a 5,000 power forward, not particularly amazing. Um, the ability to spread 4K is actually pretty decent because um, you're effectively paying like two, uh, like three CP to spread 4K damage, which is actually uh, pretty cheap, although it does hit your own forwards as well. So that's, that is something to note. Um, but this does allow fire to sort of do some very interesting, very interesting or tricky things against some more aggressive decks where you can pay to one fire, put create, uh, make bomb a forward, um, put bomb in front of a forward, block it, and then like um, before uh, combat resolves, and then bomb it for four, uh, bomb all your opponents guys for four k. So yeah, there are some interesting synergies in regards to that. And again, this is just another nice uh, it, this does allow you to set it up so where you play it on an earlier turn, and then you're always threatening being able to just pay one for uh, pay like one fire to just deal four k to all all guys. So it's just kind of like a like a ongoing threat in that regard. So um, so yeah, so this card, I'm not really too sure about this. Um, definitely uh, this set has pushed really hard, um, all these effects that are going to like do AOE damage for, from fire and do a lot of ping damage. And yeah, so it's really going to be interesting to see which particular cards fire players will choose to like build their ping like suite out of. And this card potentially, so potentially this card with Sage can like AOE for 6Ks. Um, yeah, potentially, yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of sort of interesting combinations, but really the forwards that make up the meta, um, will determine which numbers you have to hit. And from those numbers, we can determine which answers we will be using to AOE for those amounts of damage. So um, yeah, this, this card potentially might see play depending on the numbers that we, we might need to hit. Next, we have Bomb. So Bomb is put into a break zone, choose one forward, deal 5,000 damage, and it's a one CP forward. So it is kind of like Vivi, um, starter deck Vivi that we have from Opus 3. So 
Pros and cons of it. So it does cost one. So it's a one cost 5,000 damage nuke. And that's pretty good within itself. But it doesn't really have any sort of like additional abilities in regards to that. So um, yeah, so it is kind of limited in that regard. There's, um, yeah, dealing 5k damage is just kind of like a half nuke. Um, definitely if you've got like, if you're playing a deck like Emperor, uh, a Fire Emperor Zand deck, then being able to just one CP 5k is actually pretty good. A lot of times um, the Emperor Zand decks will attack with Emperor Zand, put 5k onto something, your opponent doesn't really block, and you're forced to play Vivi or play Furion or something to like finish a forward off. And sometimes you may not want to commit another forward to the field or you may not have the resources to it. And one cost bomb just kind of gives you like a like an easy way to do that. Um, there is monster support as well. So being able to recur like one cost bombs are actually not too bad. 5k damage is pretty good. Um, on the downside, it doesn't have Vivi's ability to shoot for 8k and 8k is a very relevant number to hit. So um, again, this, this card is only really going to see a play in fire decks that already have a lot of ability to ping. But if you, yeah, if you do have a lot of very cheap and efficient ways to like ping your points, guys, so damage and bomb is going to be a very cheap and efficient way for you to finish guys off. Next, we have Marsh. It's a free CP forward at 7,000 power. Dull and active forward. Choose one forward, blocking Marsh. Deal a damage equal to, equal to the power of the dull forward. So this card um, basically makes it very difficult for your opponent to block. If your opponent blocks this card, you always um, have the ability to dull and active forward you have to deal that damage to your opponent's forward. Um, a couple of things to note. So one is that um, it's not limited to one. So you can just dull multiple of your forward to deal multiple, like deal all their damage to your opponent's blocking forward. Um, in addition, um, Marsh can also dull himself. So if you do have a way to brave Marsh, then Marsh can brave attack and then dull himself to just sh shoot the damage. And also just like, it's pretty handy in that, um, yeah, fire has a lot of ways to pump up the guy. So I, you could potentially see yourself um, attacking with one of your first guys, you use selfie on it, give a plus 2,000 power to it at the end of the turn. And then Marsh attacks, they block Marsh and then you like, um, dull whatever other guys to like shoot it with like Marsh's ability. So Marsh is actually like a very difficult like forward to deal with. Um, yeah, like in terms of combat. And so this card unlocks quite a few interesting ways to play. Um, yeah, like we were talking about earlier with Marauder, you like play Marauder and yeah, if you can brave him or you can reactivate him, then you can always dull him to shoot it, like shoot a guy for 9k damage or something, right? Um, so this, this card is pretty fun. Um, and we'll probably see play actually, um, we'll probably see play. Um, potentially if you, <laughs> if we, if, if, uh, sync Chinke? Um, the, the, the ace cadet or the type zero cadet from Opus 3 still sees play and fire, then this potentially might be a very nice combination for the two. Um, so yeah, so you might see, uh, uh, chink, like, uh, like use the S ability, brave, hit for 10k, your opponent doesn't block it, then marsh attacks, and then you can dole the, the chink for like plus 10, plus 10,000 to shoot a guy. Um, yeah, it got some interesting combos there. So, uh, marsh is going to be a fun card and it's got very nice art. It's part of the FFTA, um, set of cards which doesn't have a like a lot of like support like at the moment but uh yeah we'll, we'll, we'll see how this like the ffta deck builds around next we have the second fire legendary it is sabin so it is a four cp eight thousand power forward it uh has yeah free free abilities and like i say anytime a guy has free abilities and it's on curve it's going to be broken and sabin is pretty op so when Sabin enters the field or attacks to choose one forward to control, it cannot be broken this turn. So immediately that sort of like is very good already. Um, pay one fire, pay, uh, sorry, pay fire one. Sabin gains plus 2,000 power until the end of the turn. You can only use his ability while Sabin is attacking. And the Rising Phoenix, which is S fire fire two, deal to 8,000 damage to all forwards. You can only use his ability while Sabin is attacking. So let's break this down. So first of all, um, his enter playability and his attack ability is like both very uh, like are both very good in terms of like yeah making a guy unbreakable for a turn is very very good. As, um, if you definitely if you're playing any sort of deck that can instant speed guys in, so if you're playing um, Earth as well with uh, with Tama or you're playing Ice with Devout, you can always just instant speed put this guy into play in response to your opponent's destruction ability. So that's very good by itself. Also, every time he attacks, he can trigger this ability. He doesn't have to like make himself invulnerable. He can make someone else invulnerable. Um, and this obviously comes in with a lot of uh, cool abilities as well. So if like, um, if you are using like the, uh, the heroic Kefka that um, breaks, uh, that deal, gets, gets plus 5,000 power and then breaks a guy at the end of the turn, um, Sabin combos with that very well. You can make one of you guys unable to be broken, then Kefka it to give it a pump and it doesn't die. Um, yeah, so this card is very, very strong in that regard. So first ability is good. Second ability of pay fire, pay one, plus 2,000 until the end of the turn, you only use while Sabin is attacking. 
that pretty much means Sabin is like this train he's just going to go in, okay? And so, so it's kind of a couple of, a couple of things. So first of all, it means that Sabin doesn't have to make himself invulnerable when he attacks because he's actually a pretty safe attacker. When he attacks, he can choose someone else. And if someone tries to block him, he can just steamroll through them, okay? Second thing, he can do this multiple times, okay? So as long as you've got CP, your opponent is going to very unlikely try to stop this guy, all right? So yeah, if you have LeBrow on field, it's base 9,000. And then yeah, if your opponent puts a 10K in front of you, you just pay it once. Get over it if you're playing like monks it then you just pay it again you can just pay it multiple times and get this guy up to like sixteen thousand. um if you want to keep your seven alive or or if you didn't use the buff to make him invulnerable you can just pump the shit out of him to just run over anything or to just break through any sort of blocker as well so this this card yeah for the second ability is also fantastic um it combos well if you have like yeah some sort of ability like um like Raoban to make use of his excess power after combat and thirdly, his S ability of being able to do 8k to all forwards is also pretty amazing. Obviously, you don't really want to be using this ability um, while you've got another guy on the field. But if you use him on the same turn that Sabin comes into play, um, if you're able to haste him, then you can play Sabin, make a guy, make one of you guys invulnerable, haste your Sabin, attack, and then like use his S ability. Um, you can basically like kind of pseudo protect one of you guys while dealing 8k to, um, to all forwards. So this 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 card's ability is actually very uh, like amazingly strong. Um, yeah, being able to like, while this guy can attack, this guy is very, very threatening. Um, and yeah, if you can instant speed him in with Earth or Ice, um, or not sure what else can sort of instant speed him in. Uh, but yeah, if you can like, uh, like use him, like get him in with an ability, um, then this, this just makes him extremely, extremely difficult to deal with and gives him a lot of responsive, like responsive power. So this card is fantastic. Get your free as soon as you can, because you're going to be crying when these guys go up to like $30 a card. Next is Montblanc. So Montblanc is a 4 CP backup. It's got EX Burst. When Montblanc enters the field, you may search your deck for a card named Marsh and add it to your hand. Um, it's got Fire Dull. Choose one forward, deal it 2,000 damage. You can only use this ability if you control a card named Marsh. Not a particularly good card. So first of all, we only have one Marsh in the game right now, so it's very much limited to when this one character we have on the field is. It does have an EX burst, but it also is a four cost backup. Usually, um, when you like, especially in the re more more recent sets with EX backup uh, with EX burst backups, where you generally expect them to be at free CP when they're only searching for one or two cards, and this card only specifically searches for one card. So I would have expected this to be a free CP backup. So technically, it's like one over costed for it, and its new ability is not particularly amazing considering you need Marsh, a very narrow character. Like a very like a single character in order to use his ability. So I personally think that the the card is overcosted. Um, it only has one target to search for, which means you can't run multiple copies of Mont Blanc. And you, its ability to deal like two K damage is not good enough. Um, I kind of would have expected it to be Fire Doll to like three K. Um, if you're forced to do it, if you're forced to do it only when you have Marsh out. So this card is just underwhelming all regards. It costs too much. Doesn't search for enough targets. Um, and its uh, its ability inherently on itself while you have Marsh on the field is not kind of good enough for that. So this card is not particularly good. I don't think you'll really see any play. And next card is General Leo. So it's a free CP forward. It seems like a lot of the a lot of the Final Fantasy six characters in Fire are all seven K forwards. So gen when General Leo attacks, choose one forward and put controls, deal it two thousand damage. Uh, two thousand damage is not that much. Um, it's a pretty underwhelming amount. Yes, it allows him to trade against nines, but 7k, it means that he's going to be stopped by 8ks, right? Um, so its first ability is a little bit underwhelming. Um, potentially, he might be better if you combo with, with other stuff like with Cyan, giving him Brave as well, but that's kind of really like Cyan's ability as opposed to General Leo's ability. Um, he does have a pretty good S ability of S3, deal 5,000 damage to all fours of your opponent's control. So it's a it's a AoE ability, 5,000 damage is a very good number to be hitting, and it only hits your opponent's forward. So it, it doesn't um, it doesn't hit your own guys which is pretty good so potentially we might see general general leo being like a anti-aggro uh, anti-aggro like anti-swarm fire like sort of tech card in that it's cheap it can like ping for damage and it can also spread for 5k on s ability so this card like isn't particularly good um i don't think you'll see much play uh, you could try to play it but this card by itself is not impressive more likely you're going to be playing a lot of the other ff6 cards like um, like Cyan, like Locke, and so on to like really sort of push um, the, the FF6 archetype forward. Generally, it was kind of not good enough for this, and I don't really think he'll see much play. He'll probably be cut in a lot of, in a lot of decks. 
Next card is Lednar. So when Lednar blocks or is blocked, your opponent does. Uh, if your opponent does not pay two, Lednar cannot be broken this turn. When Lednar is chosen by a summoner ability of your opponent, your opponent does, if your opponent doesn't pay two, Lednar cannot be broken this turn. So basically, whenever he is blocked, or is blo or whenever he blocks or is blocked or chosen by ability or summon, your opponent has to pay two. If your opponent doesn't, he can't be he can't be broken this turn. So <clears throat> something very interesting to note. Your opponent has to pay every instance of two in order to break this guy. Now, um, in terms of combat, it is annoying. So potentially um, we might see like, so there's two ways to play this card. So one is that he's a card that penalizes certain colors and he's also an aggro card. So if he's an aggro card, you can play him early and your opponent, if they want to try to block him and kill him, your opponent is forced to spend a lot of resources to try to do so. So your opponent has to pay the CP to get a bigger guy. You run your lead iron and your opponent has to decide whether they want to just block and let this guy live or block and discard a card um, to uh, in order to make sure he dies. So as an aggro card, it just depletes your opponent's resources. So that's something that's pretty handy. And if your opponent doesn't do it, then they're like leaking damage. Um, but it's also used in, useful in that it can penalize certain colors. Now, this, probably, uh, this card probably penalizes um, wind to a certain extent because um, wind has a lot of sort of ping effects that do one or two K worth of damage. But you think about it this way, every time your opponent tries to ping Lednar, for one or two K, they have to pay two every single instance. If they do not pay two on any of those instances, your your opponent can't break him. So this guy could almost never be broken by your Stola, right? Because like your Stola, cool, you you pay one, deal one K, but then you have to pay a two cost penalty and make sure he can die. Um, so this card is very resilient in that regard. Um, so yeah, so this card is going to be annoying, and uh, whether he's going to fit in an aggro archetype or like sort of a tech card archetype is going to be interesting to see. Um, but I li like I like this card as a gimmick. Um, whether he will see sort of more high level play, I'm not sure. I don't quite think so. Um, but this card is going to be like a, a tedious annoyance for people that do sort of play him. So yeah. And I believe that is it for all the fire cards of this set. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you have any comments or have any questions, definitely feel free to post them down in the comment section below. If you enjoy my content, please subscribe and thumbs up the video. It really helps out the channel. Like definitely it might not see much on, on from your end, but it does um, help a, a lot with the YouTube algorithm. So we can get more of this content out to the people out there. And it helps me like keep this content, for, uh, keep making this content on a regular basis and make it free. So really appreciate it guys. Hope you guys enjoyed and I'll have the next part of our video tomorrow. And this time I'm actually promising I'll have it the next day because this week I'm pretty free. I'm just going to pump these out. So thanks a lot for watching guys. Grad J out.